What comes to your mind when you hear the terms oil spill? Maybe this. I agree. Oil spill is usually a term that's, that's coined with an oil tanker in the middle of an ocean, vast volumes of oil that look very pretty like a rainbow from the top, but actually at the bottom it's a dark, murky story. The animals are frightened, they're scared, they don't know what to do of this foreign substance that's entered their environment. In fact, that bird, that's a very famous bird, even though it's in agony. That bird was pictured from one of the worst oil spill disasters in US history. However, oil spills may not only occur in water, they can also occur in soil, in the land. These oil contaminated sites have similar devastating impacts. Canada has more than 4,000 plus oil contaminated sites. Which brings the question, how do we clean up these sites? Well, as engineers, we have a number of different methods, but broadly, they can be grouped into physical, chemical, and biological approaches. Let's go over each of them. So what are physical approaches? Well, these approaches mainly look towards containing the oil, or maybe excavating a part of the land and treating it elsewhere. If you guessed it, you're right, that these require a lot of infrastructure, manpower, equipment. Thus, while they may be okay to use in regions in normal climates, they're very difficult to be used in remote regions in the subarctic because of cost. Thus, they are not sustainable. Chemical methods, on the other hand, rely on chemicals to clean up the spill. This actually sometimes works, but these chemicals are worse than the spill itself. They are toxic, they are harsh, and they render the land clean, but totally not in use for agriculture. They disturb the biota, they are very, very toxic. Thus, they cannot be used. Biological methods, on the other hand, rely on the microbes, the bacteria that are already present in the soil to clean up the oil spill. They rely on the indigenous bacteria. Thus, they can be applied anywhere, here or in remote regions. They are sustainable, they don't have any toxic impacts, and thus, this is a good approach to follow when cleaning up oil spills in a sustainable manner. This leads me to delve into how a biological treatment takes place. So the oil spill, in the onset of an oil spill, in a biological treatment, we add nitrogen and phosphorus to stimulate the growth of the bacteria. Keep in mind, all living organisms, you, me, the bacteria, we all need a ratio of C, N, and P to survive. Carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus are the building blocks of life. By supplying nitrogen and phosphorus, we are stimulating the growth of the bacteria, leading them to increase in number and cleaning up the spill. So let's go over our bioremediation pipeline. So you have an oil spill, you add nitrogen and phosphorus, the bacteria grow in number, so far so good, but even though we did all these steps, there is still a fraction of sites that are uncleaned. There is still residual contamination in substantial amounts in a number of sites. Why is this so? Why is it that despite following all the steps, we still don't have good cleanups? And to answer this question, let me give you a magnified view of, of what happens in the soil. So this is a simulated diagram of an oil spill where you see the bacteria, the Pac-Man, you see soil moieties, and you see the oil spill. Now in the onset of an oil spill, oil is a carbon source, and it tells the bacteria, come, there's food, let's grow. And you add the nitrogen and phosphorus, so the number of bacteria, they increase. The bacterial count increase, the oil, they slowly start consuming the oil until the volume of oil shrinks where it is only present in tiny pore spaces within the soil. Now the bacteria, they want to access this oil, but they cannot because the entry points are very small for the bacteria to go through. At this point, it is not a food problem. It is an accessibility problem. And bacteria, they need food to survive. So they will go to alternate carbon sources like soil organic carbon. And this residual oil remain sequestered in these cavities, undegraded. Residual contamination that was not bioaccessible is undegraded. And this is the problem that we are, I am trying to solve in my PhD, using a combination of microbiology 
and geochemistry. Now that we have set the stage, let me take you to my lab. So in the lab, I work with contaminated soils from subarctic Canadian regions, mainly traditional First Nation territories. Why? Because they still rely on diesel for their power source. These regions are so remote, the transmission lines cannot access these regions, leading to contamination. And this is the contamination we are trying to solve, address. So in the lab, I start by microcosm experiments. You remember when I said you add nitrogen and phosphorus to clean up the soils? We are exactly doing the same thing, only in small glass bottles. From these reactions, I do two types of analysis. I do bacterial community analysis, broadly trying to answer who are the major hydrocarbon degraders, how are these bacteria present between the soils, and so on. In parallel, we also want to measure the bioaccessible and inaccessible scenarios. So we want to measure the submicron habitats of the, from these soils. Let's start with bacterial assemblies. What are the two main questions we are trying to address here? Who are the major degraders? How are they different between or similar between the soils? What are the trends between biodegradation responses? That's what we're trying to answer through this analysis. And to do that, the first step is to understand the biodegradation responses between the different soils. These are results from microcosm experiments Along the y-axis, you have the percentage of contaminants remaining, and the x-axis is time. Please note that these experiments are all done under actual site conditions, the same temperature, moisture, everything is the same. We are mimicking whatever that's happening in the site in the lab. And we see that in case of saluit, two things happened. Number one, the overall biodegradation was phenomenally good. More than 80% was removed over 50 days. Number two, adding nutrients actually helped as opposed to not having nutrients. However, that's not the case in all soils. In four of them, the biodegradation response was OK. Not too bad, not too good. However, the three soils were really had very poor biodegradation. More than 60% of the contaminant was still present after 50 days. This is what we had anticipated, right? Different biodegradation responses from the different soils. So now let's try to see how to characterize the bacteria that's present in the soil. And to do this, we follow a very high throughput, a very detailed approach. So I start by extracting the soil genomic DNA. I then sequence the DNA using high throughput molecular biology methods. And for sequenced information, I resolve that using computer scripts. And what that tells us is, it tells us patterns. It tells us trends. Who are the major degraders? For example, the blue Pac-Man, the blue bacteria, seems to be associated with a much higher biodegradation extent. So soils that would have the blue bacteria should have higher biodegradation. The red bacteria on the other side is not a good member in this category. This is the result that we are trying to get from this analysis that is right now ongoing. Once we have measured or analyzed the bacterial community, we also need to analyze their submicron habitats. So what are the major questions we are trying to answer here? Well, number one, how can we quantify these habitats? These habitats are really small. We are talking at the micron level. And number two, what are the correlations between this submicron characterization and the field, field data? What correlations exist? So before I step into how to characterize these submicron habitats, let's remember, we want to preserve the structure of the habitats while characterizing them, because space is a major factor in these habitats. So we need non-invasive methods of characterization, and we do that using X-ray microcomputer tomography. That is basically the CT scan that we all have heard of, except at a much, much higher resolution, right down at the micron level. So we take a sample, we shower it with x-rays, and we get two-dimensional cross-section images. Once we get these images, we recombine them back to get the original three-dimensional soil. And from there, we can understand, we can interpret the bioaccessibility and inaccessibility extents. This is what a X-ray microcomputer tomography setup and result would look like. 
But you see on the left, in that small box, that's my sample. That's one grain of soil that had to be carefully isolated as if I was playing football and put into a nice small support and keep it there so that it doesn't break, it doesn't, nothing happens to it. And we are imaging that using x-rays. And what we get is we can see the soil, we can see the pore spaces, that's the gray part, and we also have the rock and the mineral debris and so on. What are we trying to get out of this analysis? Let's, let's look at soil like a network. It's like a network of roads, highways, freeways that you encounter when you come to work from your home. That's the brown network, that's the soil. If this network has a lot of broad roads, broad alleys, highways, it's easy for the bacteria to access these roads, leading them to degrade the contamination that is present. However, if the roads are constricted, narrow, extremely small for the bacteria that they cannot access, then the contamination remains in these, in these cavities. And to quantify this, we have two parameters, porosity and pore connectivity. So let's go a bit deeper into what are these two parameters. So what is porosity? It is the fraction of voids that are present in the soil. In simple terms, it is the number of pores. However, that's not useful in its sole sense. By knowing the number of pores, you can only answer, okay, the amount of space available to the bacteria, but hey, you need to know how these pores are connected. That is why the pore connectivity is very important. Knowing how the pores are connected can tell us how the bacteria can access the various regions within the soil. And to answer that, we use a metric, or we depend on a metric called Euler connectivity. Now let's go one step deeper to understanding what is Euler number. Euler number basically gives us a measure of the ease of bacterial accessibility. The more negative your Euler number, the more interconnected the network is. Now let me take you back to the bigger picture. If you have a soil where you have very good porosity and very good interconnectivity, I would expect excellent degradation. Why? Because the bacteria can access all these pores, it's so easy for them to go around and, con and, and clean up the contamination, provided, of course, you add nitrogen and phosphorus. But if you have a soil where the porosity is very low and the pore connectivity is also not good, then you have isolated islands that are contaminated and bacteria cannot access these islands because the road doesn't exist or the road is too small for them to traverse. This is the question that we are trying to answer from the submicron characterization. At the end of the day, what's the bigger, big picture questions that we're trying to solve? Well, the microbial analysis is telling us who are the degraders and what are the trends between the different soils. Is there one particular degrader class that is present universally in the soils which is associated to good biodegradation and so on? The submicron characterization is telling us the bacterial habitats, the accessibility and inaccessibility considerations of the different soils, a comparison and how they link back to the overall degradation response. What this will tell us is it will provide practitioners a predictive analysis before they proceed with cleanup operations. Canada has more than 4,000 plus oil contaminated sites. And a number of these sites have variable response to biodegradation. Biodegradation is sustainable, it's cheap, and now I hope that after today's presentation, both you and I know how to address different responses, inconsistent responses in biodegradation, why these responses exist, and how we can have methods to address the inconsistency. Thank you for your time.